Hello, uh, my name is Baltimore Fats, and welcome to my first video. Uh, this is a test video. Uh, I only have just downloaded the software and I'm trying to figure it out. Um, but I wanted to introduce myself a little bit, and um, I figured as a good test video, I just wanted to do random sort of research and see what came up. Uh, in the future, my videos are going to feature lots about the city of Baltimore. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm very much inspired by the Rebel Without a Pause channel and his Man in the Street in Glasgow um, videos, um, which really inspired me to look around the city of Baltimore, you know, after discovering the, the idea of the mud flood. Uh, and as I make more videos, I will be giving proper shout-outs to everybody. This test video, however, is inspired mostly by the Conspiracy Our Us channel and is very much in that mode. Um, so what I did was I just did a search for oldest buildings in Baltimore. And this is what came up. And I chose this one. I really like the look of this one. It, it definitely has that... Gilded Age, post-Victorian kind of look to it. And so here we go. Here's what I discovered about this building in Baltimore. I'm going to start here. It was built to be the J.F. Weisner and Sons Brewing Company. And this picture here comes from a book called The Maryland History in Prints, 1743 to 1900. And believe me, I am going to be going to the library and looking for this book. Um, so here you see an artist's representation of it. You know, clearly it is in the very late 1800s because they do show an electric cable car here. Although there's horse and carriage and people. You know, this is um, the front building that um, was in the picture. And it shows... The factory back here, they call this a bottling plant. I'm going to talk a minute about that, you know, and more factories, warehouses, what have you. I wanted to point out these features in this artist's rendition. You know, we have the flagpole here, um, but also these little towers in the warehouse, all of them have, you know, poles or antenna on them. These back here as well with another flagpole. And this tower here also seems to have some form of antenna. You know, so that kind of fits in with the sort of free energy idea, maybe. Um, you know, certainly doesn't detract from that idea uh, with this representation. Uh, so I thought that was kind of interesting when I first saw this banner, this advertisement, whatever it is. So moving on, let's find out a little bit more about this building. Um... So they call it now the American Brewery Building, and they here this page says it was built in 1877. Now, as we go on, we're going to find that there's some confusion over this date. And it was originally one of two dozen buildings in a five-acre brewery complex. Um, uh, this complex replaced the original Weissner Brewing Brewery Building that was much smaller and built in 1864. So we'd been going at it about 13 years when they upgraded to this. There are no pictures of the earlier one that I could find. That's not to say they're not out there. Um, this is a, a, a detail from an old map of Baltimore. Uh, one of the videos that I'm planning to do, uh, maybe even the very first one, uh, I'm going to do a bit on old Baltimore maps, and perhaps I'll try to find this area in them. This is the house that is across the street from the brewery building, and they say that this was the residence of the Weisner family, um, and not only the family, but workers arriving from Germany as well, which I was not common practice. There's more history to this. I wanted to show this because this is sort of typical old Baltimore. Um, See this all over the city, you know, the, the red brick buildings, these cornices here. Um, 
this picture isn't very good. I did see another picture of this residence. There are low windows, practically flush with the sidewalk. Um, you know, this is probably three feet-ish off the ground, maybe more. You know, so it has some, you know, typical telltale signs of perhaps being a mud flood building. Um, this is the warehouse, uh, or not the warehouse, rather, but the um, office buildings, right? And I love the uh, archways here on these doors, you know, the points here, you know. Here's a nice old picture of it, and I'm going to get into more about this picture in a little bit. Um, but just such a beautiful building. I mean, look at this these round windows, you know, these arched windows. You know, the way this sort of cuts into the, to the ground here. You know, I always kind of look for these, this sort of faux, like, foundation if you will, on old buildings. And this is kind of a sign for me to look more closely at that building. But, I mean, just look at this beauty. Um, so here we're going to go into detail about the back of the warehouse where they did the bottling. All right? And it says, The bottling plant in the rear of the complex once had a zinc statue of King Gambrinus installed in a niche above the door. Right? And so here's a picture of him. This is a picture of the king when the building that he was on was still standing. Right? And, you know, I don't know which video it was about, or whose video it was about statues in some of these buildings and how may, maybe those statues don't belong. So I was kind of curious about this king statue and what, you know, his relation to anything may be. You know, they did uh, restore the statue in 2003 and they made him look like the Burger King king. I'm not, you know... Maybe those are traditional colors for this character. I'm not certain, but that's what he reminds me of looking at that picture, the Burger King King. So anyway, I wanted to find out more about this uh, King Gambrinus. So I know Wikipedia is not the most scholarly of sources, but this is just, you know, quick hit info, gateway information. You know, if you find this interesting, please do more research, and I would love to hear anything about that. So here we have Gimbrinus, Bramus, Bramus, I, I don't, I'll never say it right, I guess, is a legendary European cultural hero celebrated as an icon of beer, brewing, joviality, and jo, 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 joie de vivre, if I even said that right. Um... You know, so that kind of makes sense. I guess, you know, it's a brewery, but the story gets a little more interesting. Um, you know, when you get into the history of this character, um, you know, the source of the legend of Gam, uh, Bramus, Brinimus, Brinus is uncertain. An early written account by German historian Johannes Aventinus identifies Gambrinus with Gambrivius a mythical Germanic king about whom little is known. Um, two other men purported to have inspired the creation of Gambrinus are John I, Duke of Brabant, and John the Fearless, Duke of Burgundy. Um, I'm not really going to go much into them, but I did want to talk about Gambrivius here. Um, Johannes Aventinus wrote that Gambrivius Brinius is based on a mythical Germanic king called Gambrivius or Gampar, who, Aventus says, learned brewing from Osiris and Isis, um, which I thought was an interesting connection. Uh, in 1517, William IV, Duke of Bavaria, had made Aventus the official historiographer of his dukedom, you know, uh, which is interesting. Um... European anecdote credits Gambrinus with the invention of beer. Aventinus attempted to reconcile this account with much older stories attributing its origin to Osiris' agricultural teachings. In Aventinus' chronicle, Gambrivius was the paramour of Osiris' wife and sister Isis. It was by this association, he says, that Gambrivius learned the science of brewing. Um... 
you know, Ventus's account of Gambrivius co contributed to the reverence for Osiris and Isis held by 17th century European scholars, perceiving Osiris and Isis as culture bearers, enabled a willingness to see historical connections where there were none. The 59th stanza of the English drinking ode, the ex ale Asian of ale evidences a British appropriation of the myth to praise the Gambrivius, that good British king, that devised for the no nation by the Welshman's tale, 1700 years before Christ did spring the happy invention of a pot of good ale. Um, according to a Ventius, continuing on here, Gambrivius, and this is where it's really interesting in relating to the mud flood. Gambrivius is a seventh-generation descendant of the biblical patriarch Noah. You know, that's kind of a crazy flood coincidence, mud flood coincidence, and a brewery uh, connection there. Uh, by incorporating earlier myths recorded by Tacitus, Aventus reckoned that Gambrivius was the fifth son of Marso, who was the great-grandson of tu Tusto? the giant or godly ancestor of the Germanic peoples whom Tacitus mentions in Germania. So very interesting, um, you know, mud flood building, which is a brewery, the, the patriarchal mythological figure of beer, a statue on the side of it, whose legend goes all the way back to being perhaps a descendant of, the, the, of Noah of the flood, and that picture can go away. Um, also, you know, uh, who's the great grandson of Tuiso, the giant, you know, tying into some of the other mud flood stuff and uh, flood videos like uh, Wise Up, whose channel I love. Um, so, you know, just really interesting. And so I don't want to get too much more on that. Um, but this is the way the tangents roll, don't they? You know, this is a picture of the building as it stands today. They uh, refurbished it about six years or six years ago, and they did a fantastic job. It looks beautiful. Um, I know where this building is, and I'm going to go there and take some pictures of myself for myself. Um, so then I wanted to continue on. So I'm looking more into the building, I found this site, Historic Structures. You know, this is a beautiful picture of the building from a later, a slightly later period than that earlier picture. I'm guessing this is probably the 20s, maybe. Uh, they don't show railroad tracks here for that cable car or whatever it was, but just a beautiful, a beautiful structure, you know. It's really such a captivating looking building to, to me. Um, but here we go a little bit about the history of, this, of um, uh, John F. Weisner, who is the founder of this brewery, um, you know, who came from Bavaria before the Civil War. Um, and actually, while the Civil War was happening, he went back to Bavaria and cooked up his business plan with his family there to open a brewery back in the States and in Baltimore. And he opened his brewery in 1863 and added his brewery to the 21 already in operation throughout Baltimore. So just, you know, right in the middle of the Civil War, there were 21 breweries operating throughout Baltimore, which is, uh, that seems like a high number to me, given Baltimore probably wasn't that huge a city at the time. Um, uh, the brewery was built on part of the estate known as Greenwood, originally established by Philip Rogers in 1807. So, of course, you know, this is rabbit hole stuff, and so who the heck is Philip Rogers, you know? So let's check him out. So I looked up Philip Rogers' Greenwood estate, and there really wasn't much. There's this detail of where the Greenwood estate was. Um, and like I said earlier, I have something I'm going to do on older Baltimore maps, probably my first sort of official video. Um, that was certainly the way I was intending. Like I said, this is a test video. Um, so I'm going to look more into that, but I found this historic preservation certification application. So I was like, all right, let's check that out. All right. <clears throat> and
And so here it is. This was filed in 1982 for property that is on uh, West Lombard Street, 1729. Now, just quickly, I wanted to give you just a quick, like this, this dot is where the brewery is, right? And so the property that they're talking about is over here. So this guy owned property all over the city. You know, um, we're going to come back to that page too. Um, so I just wanted to give you a sense of how far away these two properties were. All right, and they say that uh, the date of construction was 1872 to 1873. And I'll show you, although I could not find a picture of that property itself, um, this is the 1400 block, which is a few blocks away, but this is what they're about to describe. And this is typical Baltimore row home, especially in you know the downtown and southern Baltimore areas, um, some of the older parts of the city. You know, and this is very typical of what you see, and I'm going to be talking a lot about these row homes in future videos. I have lots of pictures to show, but I just wanted to give you a sense of what they're showing here. And they all kind of have these low windows and these cornices, and again, I'm going to do much more on those, but I just wanted to give you a visual picture of what they were about to describe. Um, so they say those types of those buildings were built in 1872, 1873. So we go into the certificate a little bit, and I just want the, the description they have here is, is a row house sharing the typical style, proportion, scale, and materials of the district in general. So that's what I showed you, the district in general. Uh, it's an Italianate style, so they call that, I guess, Italian architecture. Three bays wide, three stories high, shed roof, rectangular plan, typical row home Baltimore and all over the world I'm sure they were built like this um, um, this the, the house rests over a raised basement which is an interesting way to sort of you know explain away the low windows um, so they go more into the house there and this is why they you know the physical appearance and then they talk about the uh, historic preservation, the statement of significance. And they say that it's significant to the Union Square Historic District for architectural and historical reasons. Um, you know, Union Square District originally was rural countryside containing the estates of wealthy Baltimoreans. Uh, development began along the Baltimore Frederick Turnpike, which was opened in 1807. Uh, very interesting year, 1807. I'm going to have to do some research about Baltimore in 1807. Um, but construction really did not begin until two simultaneous events took place. The creation of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Terminal at Poppleton and Pratt Streets and, enorm and an enormous increase in foreign immigration into Baltimore. So it's very interesting. We have, a, um, you know, they're saying that the development didn't happen until after or into the mid-1870s, as they describe here, which took place of a citywide building boom which followed the Civil War. So right after the Civil War, they're saying there was a, an enormous increase in foreign immigration, as we saw uh, Weissmer there, Weissman, whatever his name was, was from Bavaria, Germany. Uh, sorry, I keep losing my cursor. Um, you know, and the, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Terminal, Poplar and Pratchett's, I've taken pictures there. There's very interesting things around the Baltimore, uh, the B&O Railroad Museum, and Poppleton Street was actually the first street I ever lived on in Baltimore when I moved here about 12 years ago. Um, you know, so there's more coming on this in future videos. But so again, I just wanted to stress here, late in the uh, 1870s, construction in the district took place in the midst of a citywide building boom following the Civil War. So that really ties into that, you know, some of the Civil War ideas, you know, what was happening in the country at that time, perhaps, you know. Yeah, so I thought that was pretty interesting. But I don't want to get too far off on that. Again, I'm just, um, this is supposed to be more about the building itself. So here's, it gets interesting quickly. All right. 
In 1886, Weisner obtained a mortgage for $10,000 to build a new plant. Now, ostensibly, that new plant is this. Yeah, um, all right, built in 1887, right? So he's getting a mortgage in 1886 for $10,000. Now, I don't know what the you know, what $10,000 would translate into today's money, but it doesn't seem like it would be tens of millions of dollars or anything like that. Um, uh, maybe it would be. Uh, so it's just interesting, you know, who know, I don't know how much capital he had invested already or, or you know, what he needed a mortgage for $10,000 for to build this building. But, you know, they're saying this took a year, you know, or at least that's the information. That's what I'm gathering from the information they provided. There's no other construction information, that's for sure. Uh, 1886, he gets a mortgage. 1887, this building, this brewery opens. Um, um, so going further, they talk about the ups and downs of the brewery and its ownership and what was happening. But I wanted to discuss this real quick. Mm -hmm to close out this video as a, a sizable complex of buildings surrounds the brew house on both sides of Gay Street, among them a boiler house and engine room. Uh, steam was used to heat the mash from an early date when most brewers were still using direct heat. Cavernous stock cellars, cavernous stock cellars on four underground levels of brick and stone with cast iron columns and wrought iron beams is underneath this and this is what I wanted to show you okay here's the picture um, yeah so they're saying there are four underground levels here are they under this building the bottling plant this is the allegedly the brewery itself uh, you know cavernous cellars four underground levels 1886 to 1887 ten thousand dollars you know none of that sort of really makes sense to me <laughs> you know how did they build those four underground cavernous cellars you know um so that's one of the reasons you know that's something that really raised up a lot of flags for me in terms of this being you know much earlier than 1886 87 um oops you know and so, like I said, so there's an interesting, I thought, you know, for a quick little bit of research to do a test video to make uh, a mud, flood, and beer video uh, with connections to Osiris and Isis and Noah and giants. Um, so there's going to be a lot more coming from me here in Baltimore. Um, and uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, Please comment. Um, um, I would love to hear any remarks about it. And uh, thanks for watching. Bye.